If it wasn't apparent from the video you just watched, we were deep in the middle of Nebraska corn country. I really enjoyed traveling up there to meet Jerry and Mike and must say that I'm slightly envious of Mike's aviation hacienda. Having a big hangar and a well-kept grass landing field next to your house, all embedded in lush farm territory, is pretty much the promised land. By now you probably know that I am from Wichita, the air capital, and one of the biggest names in aviation is headquartered here, Cessna. When I think of Cessna, I remember the young German pilot named Matthias Roost, who on May 28, 1987, flew from Finland right through the Soviet air defenses to a landing near Red Square in Moscow. He did this flying a Cessna 172, a type I had also flown when getting my pilot's license back in the 60s. How about that, a Cessna breaking right through the Iron Curtain. I got on the phone and queried a number of contacts familiar with classic airplanes and their owners. Three different guys told me I ought to locate Bill Kohling and see if he wanted to talk about his Cessna 145 Airmaster. I thought three was a pretty good sign and proceeded to track him down by telephone. He was very interested and soon thereafter was gracious enough to receive me at his home field on two different occasions to show off the Airmaster. This airplane is a beauty and truly exhibits the flowing lines of the classic Art Deco look. Here's Bill.
Hi, I'm Bill Coling, and uh, this is my Cessna Airmaster. It's a 1938 C-145 Cessna. It is powered by a 145 horsepower Warner Scooper Scarab and was built at the Pawnee plant in Wichita, Kansas in 1938. Years ago, uh, I started flying about 1965 and uh, I just don't know, uh, we just love airplanes and the old airplanes and I fell in love with the old cantilever wing Cessnas. I loved the old radial engines and uh, I looked at the 195s, I loved them, but at the time I said I couldn't afford an airplane that took $100 to fill up. Well, today I have one. But anyway, this is the forerunner of the 195. It was built before World War II and it has a wood main spar, uh, spruce ribs, the airframe, the fuselage is steel tubing and it's uh, fared with uh, uh, spruce. And uh, anyway, it's covered with fabric. Uh, after the war, one of the reasons they went to metal was it was much easier for them to come by than quality spruce. So anyway, it, one thing was it was availability and they had uh, done a lot of subcontracting during the war, so they were practiced up on doing sheet metal work. This uh, airplane also has a unique landing gear. It's a spring oil setup, and it is cantilever. It's very soft, and it lands very easy. You can bounce it, though, <laughs> which I've done on occasions. But when they went to the 195, they decided after seeing Steve Whitman's patent the spring gear, they went and they decided to use the spring gear on the 195s, the 120s, and the rest of the newer Cessnas because it was such a, a simple, beautiful system. They uh, had to fly out of a, a runway situation instead of a nice grass field like we have right here in the center of the airport. Then they started needing to put brakes on their planes, so Cessna, when he started the A-Series, they used a modified Model T rear brake, which was a mechanical brake, and they turned the brake drum down a little bit to lighten, lighten the wheel. <coughs> well, in the later Cessnas, they started buying a regular aircraft mechanical brake and they used that up to this series of airplanes. Wallace and uh, probably Tom Solder was working there at the time. They decided that they'd try the new Goodyear multiple disc hydraulic brakes. So this is like the fourth Cessna to have hydraulic brakes. Well, that's all we have anymore, seems like, is hydraulic brakes on our airplanes except for some of the Russian yaks that operate in the cold country and they have uh, air brakes. The, the multiple disc brakes are, are really very good, uh, although parts are getting hard to uh, find on these, but they do a very good job. In fact, almost too good a job because uh, if you get on them too hard, it's possible to flip the airplane, which has been done many times in this series. For those who haven't flown in an Airmaster, uh, a few of the flight characteristics that I've found is that the, the control forces are fairly heavy. Uh, it's uh, ailerons aren't very strong, but they are there. If you don't hurry it, uh, it'll treat you fine. Uh, it's got uh, a pretty good rudder control and uh, pretty good elevator control. There is no uh, dihedral on the wing except for the taper on the bottom of the spars. The spar will bend a little bit, so you do get a little dihedral on that. Smooth air 
they really, you can pretty well just hands off these. Uh, you get in a turbulent air and you do have to work at it. Pitch wise, it's pretty heavy and uh, you really learn if you use the flaps that you really need to be very careful and use your uh, uh, trim control. And if you have to go around with these mid-court flaps, be sure that you get a good hand on the stick. For some reason, the way it's built, when you add power with those flaps down, it will pitch up uh, very, very strongly. It has a, a climb prop on it. This prop gives this airplane a very, very good takeoff. Uh, maybe not up to Super Cub standards, but it does a very nice job and it'll haul a nice load. Oh, I'd say about like 172. Um, if you put four fat people in it uh, and full fuel, you're gonna be over gross. <laughs> but anyway, Treat the old girl nice, she's pretty nice. Um, probably the longest cross country that I take and about as long as I like to sit anyway is uh, about three hours to go back to Blakesburg and it's uh, I think about 375 mile. Uh, I generally count on about 125 to 130 mile an hour cruise on this. The factory advertised 143 crews and 160 top and uh, but with this prop I could probably get about 155 mile per hour out of it just flat out but you turn the engine a oh, couple hundred rpm past redline. Of course if you ask Mr. Wallace when he was racing them he said that he run the old 145 Warner, 2700 RPM. But he advised me against it because parts are getting a little scarce. People ask me about the, the colors and the paint on this airplane and the paint scheme. and It's not exact, but it's pretty close to what it was originally. Uh, Seston, when they started their Master Series, tried a couple different paint schemes and also if you'd pay extra they would paint it the way you want it. You could get the wing a different color, you could have it uh, the wing scallop, uh, just just anything. I know but this became the most popular Airmaster paint scheme with this little arrow here and the half the arrowhead here. The FA airplanes or the CA were the same color of orange this is not quite the right shade uh, it should probably have a little more of a reddish tinge of to it but it was glade orange marine blue here and this was drake blue and maybe the next airplane would come out it would be drake blue all over and they just turn it around they just had a lot of contrasting colors at the time. Uh, I think it was great because it made them where they really stood out. Greens were popular back then, and they tell me uh, that Dwayne Wallace really liked the, the peewee green. That's why he had several of the race pl planes painted that way. And the cowling here, the one that's on this was made after World War II. It was a replacement cal. Uh, I have an earlier one, and it is very soft. This is a little harder aluminum, and it's a more durable cal, and that's why I've stuck with using this one. This, of course, their Master Series used the NACA cal, which was designed by Fred Wyke of the uh, Air Coop fame. And Fred Wyke won the S.A. Reed Prize because these cows would make the airplane run 10 mile an hour faster with no additional horsepower. This is called uh, a dishpan cow here. It fits in and the air coming out, it kind of 
helps the air flow out of there. I got one of the replacement motor mounts for the five long mount 145 Warner airplanes that they made. So I got the spare for the five. Therefore, my old dish pan did not work. So what this actually is, is another uh, do the best I could. This is a half of a UC 78 cal here. And we just cut part of it away and let it roll in. This is called the Pilot Comfort Air Scoop. And I run it closed most of the time. But when you open it up, it directs cool air over the firewall and it kind of cools the firewall a little bit because your feet are right next against the firewall. The fuselage is steel tube, chrome molly 4130, but this part is sheet metal. Back to here where the fabric starts. Mrs. Wallace still has Duane's Air Master and it's at the Liberal Air Museum, but they made a mold to make these windshields, and LP Plastic still has it. So anyway, this is a Wallace-produced windshield. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Wallace, and they gave it to me, free. <laughs> to cover the gear, this actually was hand hammered. It's actually three pieces, and they hammered out, and then torch welded it together and hammered the welds flat. And really kind of neat. The later 1938 Cessnas, like I said, this is called a C-145, went to these mid-cord flaps. And they also used these on the 195 after the war. Now, the early 1938 Cessnas, they tried a belly flap but evidently the people did not like it that well, like the Ryan SCW. And the, they had a, a, a hand lever in the cockpit and they would pump it down. And the thing would really make the whole airplane shake and rattle if you ever had to add power and go around. So the latter part of the year, and I've seen some of the uh, work on this, they uh, put a, what they call a mid-cord flap here and it's strictly a drag device and let me tell you what, it will bring you down. Now, kind of get tickled. Uh, the C-37 and C-34 of the, this series, they had uh, trailing edge flaps like all the newer Cessnas have, but they were experimenting around and then uh, one of the old Cessna pilots showed them an AW and they did an experiment with an AW with a spoiler system on top of the wing. But evidently, they thought this was a better way to go. Don't ever walk into them with them down with, with your head because guarantee a trip to the emergency room for stitches. <laughs> the pitot tube on this is a Cessna produced pitot tube. It's got the static, comes in this little, uh, the, the pressure port right here but the static's on the side. This is a little piece of brass. They run the, the static and the, and the pressure down two little eighth inch copper tubes to your, uh, your system there. Grimes made a retractable landing light and they used it on uh, all the Beach 18s and a lot of the airplanes. And anyway, uh, it kind of made a, a, a nice setup on them and the, when it would get to the bottom, then the light would come out on. And that's got uh, one of the old original great big old Grimes bulbs, but they're really geared. Just think about, you're doing about 90, 100 mile an hour, and it really makes that little old motor pant without being geared like that, you know? I decided I was gonna go like the picture of the earlier Cessnas, these numbers, look different than the the later numbers, the way it's called out in the the CARs and the FARs. The old 1926 uh, CAR said uh, 28 inches, and with the NAN and a C and all the numbers, if you used the, the stroke and the height uh, ratio, 
these numbers would almost run off the end of the wing. Now, if you look at the later Cessnas, like it's on Mr. Wallace's out at Liberal, his does almost run out of the, off the wing. But I had enough of the old number to know, and from the pictures, that this is approximately right. Okay. Now, something that uh, is kind of interesting about the ailerons on this airplane, and for somebody that would be shopping for a Cessna Airmaster, this is kind of a bad deal uh, because with this outside push rod here from the belt crank, the rainwater, if they sit out in the weather, would run in this hole and set in front of the, the rear spar there. And this one and many I've seen have rotted out here. This is not a total condemning thing, but the thing of it is, at the very least, if you got rot here, you're gonna have to scarf a patch or have them splice. And both sides of this spar have been, rear spar have been spliced because of rot uh, around this aileron push tube. This wing is really a pretty good sized wing when it's, especially when it's off the airplane, because it's one piece, it's 34 foot by seven foot. Now, if you go back to the old A series, they were 40 foot by eight foot, even bigger. So we can take our hat off to Gar Williams and the fellows down at Cessna that just restored these old AWs because it's such a huge wing and it is so vulnerable being one piece when you're moving it, that you can damage them so easy. You know, you keep looking, the wing, of course, you can see it's flat on top with no dihedral. They do claim that the spar will bend a little bit and you can get a little dihedral there, and the bottom of the wing is tapered a little bit. But anyway, this airplane, they really did some nice things to ferret in. This, they handcrafted these uh, wing root fairings and the weld runs right down, and it's two pieces, of course, and they hammered the weld flat and then filed it, and it just fared the wing into the fuselage a little nicer. Okay, and then we've got a wood turtle back here that they sits on top of the tubing that they kind of fared it, the tubing to the fuselage. The bottom has a a quarter round that is uh, shimmed away from the tubing and then of course we've got stringers like all airplanes. Now we go back to the tail and again they made a fairing here. The top is one piece that goes to here and then it's riveted into another piece and then it's welded just like the wing root fairings and it goes in there to fair the, the horizontal and the vertical fan to the fuselage. As you can see, Cessna was interested in having everything clean and cantilever. So the, the fan and the horizontal have no wires. They are cantilever. Anyway, uh, you go around here, it's got strap hinges, like of the period. It's got uh, two trim tabs for trim, for ele elevator trim, pitch trim. Stanger actually is welded together. It's two pieces seamed right here and hammered out and then it's seamed right here. And uh, this is a butt seam and this one is a flange seam here. It really uh, fares the fuselage out. It makes it look kind of nice. This, if you look at this, this probably is the right ratio for the numbers today. You look at the old uh, logo, and I believe they said it goes back to Clyde Cessnas. I believe Charlie Jones came up with this uh, Cessna bird, and then I went ahead, and since this is eligible for their master, I went ahead and put their master name under there. Rudder trim is just a little trim tab here, and they had a screw there that they could uh, 
kind of spring this tab out. Instead of having to bend it, you actually spring it out with this screw adjustment here. The old Airmaster, the tail wheel's not steerable on the later ones, but it uh, has a pin that drops down and locks the tail wheel. And it really it makes it very nice on takeoff and landing. But the, the locking mechanism is on the seat leg and you flip a lever up or down. You flip it down and it's in the lock position. But I'll get up and I'll show you. I've got this, I shoved it over the side so you can see it unlocked. And then when it comes back and locks, okay. And of course there's a little slop in the thing, but anyway, you can see that it, it uh, locks the tail wheel straight and it really helps on takeoffs and landings. We go to the older airplanes and this has got a nice streamlined knob on it. But anyway, uh, Cessna used a Dayton latch and then they built the rest of the mechanism, like the, the lever, they machined that lever out and it kind of looks like some of the old cars. But this, instead of having a handle, it's got this little lever which operates the door latch. The older Cessnas all have slide windows for on the ground, and you, uh, it does help in hot weather. <laughs> but the best thing is just open the door and hold it open. In the Airmaster series, going from the earlier A series, Clyde Cessna did not like to disturb any of the, the structure. And the sides of the fuselage was a worn truss, you know, that has the diagonals between the uprights and the top and the bottom. But in order to make it easier to get in and out, one thing that the Airmaster had, they made a bigger door to facilitate getting in and out. That's a lot better than an AW, I'll guarantee you. The pilot would have to get in first. He climbs up, kind of sits on his seat, gets over, then the co-pilot or the next person would get in and then he would slide the seat up and then your back seat passengers would get in. And that's the order that uh, you would load. A simple interior to the thing, the, the side panels uh, were originally wool and they had a, a muslin lining. They probably just used some of the fabric to try to give you additional protection. They used non-raveling wool carpet, uh, wool side panels, wool seats, although there was a few at the very last, they actually used rayon and it had a, a, a trade name. Of course, today we wouldn't like that because rayon melts and burns. You know, the cub, they just uh, doped the, uh, a fabric and you had a dope finish on the side. <laughs> And you get in the best you can. And visibility to the sides is pretty good, but straight ahead with the tail in the three-point uh, position, you can't see ahead. Now, once you get the tail up, and if you do uh, uh, get the tail up on your takeoff roll and do a wheel landing, then you have uh, uh, good visibility over the nose. Probably over the nose uh, in flight is better than the 195. The, the panel on this is uh, one that was in the airplane. Uh, it'd been flown for years and uh, they added to it. So basically it wasn't in that bad a condition, but we did, instead of replacing the panel, we just filled the holes and it's kind of nice. We've got a cylinder head on it and manifold pressure, which you really don't need for fixed pitch prop, but it, it's kind of fun to, to see. Uh, position lights here, of course. And this, here's the old Luckenheimer primer that you turn on before you prime. Here's your panel lights. Now here was an option, the old cigarette lighter that when it get hot will glow. When the, the element would get hot, the glow would transmit uh, through the plastic there. Anyway, Nice thing to smoke in an airplane that originally come out with nitrate dope. <laughs> when I bought this old airplane from John Howard, these were the three instruments that came with airplane, and I think they come out with airplane in 1938. So these are the three originals. The rest of these I've got somewhere. Thanks to Mrs. Wallace 
uh, she gave me the turn bank out of the Yellow Airmaster Liberal, so that's uh, kind of a unique deal there. Plus the windshield, thank you, Mrs. Wallace. <laughs> they really varied uh, quite a little bit. C-38 would have uh, different arrangements. Uh, the, if a person wanted a, a custom panel, they would fix it. If they wanted to supply their own instruments, I've seen the orders, they would let the guys, they'd cut the holes and the people would uh, supply their instruments. These would have been optional gauges here. The rate of climb and the turn bank. This is supposed to be a read right amp meter and it's not. It's probably some old tractor which would be right in line. It is a Ford fuel gauge which works very good, about 35, 36 Ford. The Colesman Bay Window Compass. They went from the old fish globe to the Bay Window and then probably during the war and after the war, this was flat glass. You know, it never had these labels on it. The, the FA, when they come out and issued the airworthiness, we had to label everything. The earlier ones just had a V on it, and then the old throttle used to have the instructions pushed open. But these are standard working instruments. The C-37, they had a lot of them that this out was off, in was on. So there's something that they standardized too in the few years that they were making these airplanes. In order to get brakes, your toe goes under the strap. You've got to lift your toe and push down with your heel. The problem with these things on the earlier ones is when you had full rudder and needed that brake, that the heel would hit the floor. One thing unique about the old Air Masters is the location of the wind generator. It's uh, on the required equipment list because it have electric flaps. It was so easy to put a wind generator. Well, Cessna put it in this location right here in the leading edge of the wing. The blades have had uh, some bad uh, history of breaking and they've got a chance of either going out or in. And it seems like uh, a couple of incidents they actually went in. It is said that one of these blades broke and went through the windshield and killed uh, Dutch Rodden. That would be Herb Rodden's brothers because the Rodden brothers were really very, very active in the flying business. And of course, we think about his brother Herb with the Traveler Mister Ship. This is the earlier one. It's got the 145 horse. Uh, Super Scarab Warner in it. It's an SS50, which indicates the taper shaft. The 50A is the spline shaft. This is uh, still has the old grease type rocker arms, and you got to pull the cowl off every 20 or 25 hours and grease the rocker arms, oil the valve stems, and kind of give it a look over. Now, you talk about old engines, well, Probably the technology, the metallurgy and all that, it's not as good, but the thing of it is, you can't get by not maintaining these. They just won't fly. So, because you got to open them up and look at them every 20, 25 hours, I would say they're just as safe as a new airplane. Flight characteristics, you got to stay with them. There's no sitting and filling out your logbook on rollout because you'll be out in the middle of wheat field somewhere. Luckily, it'll be a wheat field instead of a bunch of trees. The propeller on this is a Curtis Reed. Uh, Curtis Aircraft, they bought the S.A. Reed patents. According to Mr. Wallace and uh, uh, said the airfoil and the design of this prop it is a very efficient prop. It's not controllable, but if you want to go for speed, you have it pitched for speed. It's a very nice looking propeller, and uh, it was a very efficient prop. It burns about nine gallon an hour the way I cruise it, and I don't push it too hard. The crankshaft runs on three ball bearings, and uh, then you have a master rod bearing, which is a uh, a plane bearing 
and then the rest of the rods are pinned around the number one, around the, uh, the base part of the rod. So anyway, it's like a one cylinder engine with uh, six other cylinders attached to the uh, bottom of the rod. I hope uh, that <laughs> you've enjoyed looking mold Air Master over. Uh, there's actually probably about 10 of these flying at present time today and several under construction. There's probably 50 on the registry anymore and we'd like to see some of these fellas get theirs going. It's just been a very, very enjoyable, fun time. You meet the most wonderful people, very few bad experiences in the aviation field. And thank you again for letting me share. The first airplane ride that I can remember was the when the Flying Farmers had the Capper Foundation penny a pound flights. <laughs> and a penny a pound wouldn't go very far anymore, but you know, if I could work it up, I'd always make sure that I could get at least a couple rides. A real thrill was the time that Wendell Doonan was out with his uh, Aztec. And you know, the seeds were planted. But Ed, Ed Weatherford was my original instructor. He said, well, let's start out in the Cherokee. It was 11.50 an hour wet. It ended up that uh, it took me about a year and a half to get my license. You know, sometimes we're so stuck with the hun drum down here and uh, the clutter of buildings and stuff. And you know, you get up in the sky and you can look down and you really look this really is God's creation. It's just man cluttering it up, but it's still beautiful from there. And uh, it's so neat, you know, uh, you're just kind of like to say, free as a bird up there. Anyway, I, oh, Alan brought back some pictures from Oshkosh of an air master. Well, I said, oh, what is this? Well, this is the granddaddy of the 195, and it has a little smaller engine. Well, of course, I thought, well, you know, maybe this is a little more affordable. Well, about this time, Dwayne Shank stopped by the hangar and got talking. I says, you know, I really think maybe I need an air master. Well, he says, I just happened to know what we're ones at. When I went down to pick it up, it was like Memorial Day, 1973. That is when the Arabs had shut the gas off. Dad let me use the big truck, which made four mile a gallon, to go down and pick it up. If you weren't a regular customer, they either wouldn't sell you gas at all, or it'd be like $2. <laughs> and we would take it. And I kind of think at the time it was 50 cents a gallon. So anyway, we didn't turn down any gas that we could buy. <laughs> I had still no place to store it, so I went down to old Bud Pink's to friend of mine, we stored the wing in his old chicken house. We hang, hung it from the rafters for about a year till Weebies could get around to rebuild the wing for me. And I'll guarantee you, the people at Cessna think enough, and that was when Dwayne Wallace was still in Cessna, that Dwayne told Bob Alder and Bob Pickett, says, get that boy a copy of the microfilm so he can have some prints. This is proprietary information, and but Mr. Wallace and and uh, they absolutely bent over backwards to help. I had uh, questions to ask Dave Bram and a lot of those people. Says and the old timers were says, well, just get in there and do it. Says just keep them gear legs the same distance from the tail post and you'll be all right. Essentially had no paint room, so we'd have to find a good day, pull it outside, to, and you know when the wind doesn't blow in Kansas, you know how many days you have like that? <laughs> but anyway, poor people have poor ways, so we painted it in pieces and then put it together. 
I didn't make the first flight on my Air Master. Uh, oh, Al was sitting there worried that I'd get hurt. And uh, I'd come out the day that I was going to have the first flight, and he was wiping the bugs off. And he says, yeah, it flies okay, Bill. Uh, well, I was a little upset with him because, you know, I won the first flight, but that was okay. So he kind of gave me a little talking and out I go. And, you know, it was so nice. The old Cessna on takeoff was so nice. I mean, lifted the tail and then she lifted up. and She really was nice. But uh, coming in and land, it wasn't quite like the Pacer. Uh, an old Cub, you know, and the old Pacer, you could get it probably the nose 15 degrees off and you could just, just straighten it right out. If you let that old Air Master get 15 degrees off, you're going off the runway. And I think the reason is uh, the old cantilever wing is heavy, and if it's not lifting, you've got that big old heavy wing up there that's got a lot of leverage, and it's just trying to crank you off the runway. <laughs> so you don't give the, much, the old girl very much slack. I love the old radial engine. There's nothing that sounds as good as an old radial cackling by. You can sit there, you can hear them miles away, and you know that you got a round motor up there. And naturally, you look. I'm going to flat tell you, antiques are not for everybody. You've got to want to, you're going to really have to do some of your own maintenance. You want to have a little mechanical. Uh, ability, but if you're really taken by one of the old airplanes, a good way to start is if you know anybody that has one, talk to them, sit in it, see if you can get a ride in it, let them let you take the controls, see how comfortable they are, see if you'd want to put up with that. If you're really still interested and like the old airplanes, do join the, the Antique Aircraft Association or the Vantage Aircraft join one of these associations and go to some of the fly-ins because there's people out there to help you uh, all along the way. I don't know, I always thought uh, really if I get up to the point where I can't, if I'm able to fly and I can't pass my medical according to standards, uh, before I flunk that, I think I'll build me one of them peak pole air campers with a Model A engine. <laughs>